Today is December 19, 1995, and I'm speaking with John Shevlin at his home in Sedona, Arizona. We're talking about the Shevlin Hickson Company of Bend, Oregon. This is tape number 11 of the Shevlin Hickson Oral History Project. My name is Ron Gregory, and the tape belongs to me. So here. Okay. Uh, I'd like to begin this interview, John, by asking when and where you were born. Uh, I was born in Portland, 1930. Okay. Uh, how were you and your family connected to the Shevlin Carpenter and Clark Company of Minneapolis? Uh, Dad was transferred there uh, from Omaha in about 1929, I believe. Uh, no, it may have been just a little later, right after I was born, and uh, I was adopted by my parents, and uh, then uh, Dad was transferred to Minneapolis, so that would have been probably 31, somewhere around in there. So you, so your relatives then are the Shevlins of the Shevlin, uh, Carpenter, and Clark? Right. Okay, right. Uh, what was your, or you are his, or his relation to uh, Tom Shevlin, who started the company on the bend? Uh, he would be um, Tom Sr. or Tom Jr.? Tom Jr. Uh, the one that died of pneumonia. pneumonia. Right. Uh, I think they were uh, second cousins, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, was the company primarily a family-operated enterprise? Uh, at one point, uh, it started out that way back in Michigan when they had that, and then uh, I'm not sure about the finances or whatnot, but then the Carpenters got in, and the Clarks, and uh, so that, but that was more of a sales arm, and, um, but Tom Shevlin was the guiding light for building the sawmill like that. Right, yeah, and, and he's oftentimes in the, the literature that I see referred to as uh, Tom Shevlin of Harvard. Apparently he was a heck of a football player. Yes, he was All-American, and uh, then he also used to uh, race his uh, car against the railroad from New Haven down to, of course, bonded with the one of the historians back there, who's a railroad buff, and I have quite a bit of stories about Tom Shevlin oh, in his college days. So, so it was Tom Shevlin then that, that was the main push behind the company? The drive, the total that, drive. Okay, yes. okay. Uh, was the Shevlin Carpenter and Clark Company the parent company of the Shevlin Hickson Company in Bend, Oregon? I think it was more the uh, sales arm. Uh, the Shevlin Hickson Company uh, originally, I think, was named because of uh, Pennell Hickson's um, parents, and uh, who were Portland-based. And, uh, but I think the Carpenter and Clark was its so called a sales arm. Uh, you know, I have here in my hand a letter dated 1932 from the Chevron Carpenter and Clark Company to its stockholders and employees and friends. Uh, this letter includes some 20 associated and affiliated companies. Uh, and the question for me is were these companies? Uh, something like satellite companies that Shevlin, Carpenter, and Clark owned? Do you know? Have you had I'd like to see that. This uh, is something that's kind of been a mystery to me. It was at a time when uh, I think Mr. Carpenter was asking to step down as president of so many of these companies. Right. I think most of them um, were um, all wholly owned. By the Chevron yes. Carpenter and Clark. Uh -huh. okay. Right. Right. Yes. I believe they were all wholly owned. I I remember Pauline's very well. And um, yeah, he was there in Minneapolis. Pauline. Oh, Paul, Paul Ames. Paul Ames. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think he was out at Ben for a short while too before yeah. he went back to to Minneapolis. Minneapolis. To right. Residency there. Right. You know, I see on this list also uh, that there's a, uh, a company with the name of Shevlin Carpenter and Scanlon Company Limited. Uh, do you know whether or not uh, Brooks Scanlon and Shevlin Scanlon had 
joint ventures and things? Uh, Not really. This one, uh, Seven Carpenter and Scanlon. Uh, that could have been, and you say this is what, 1932, 1932. okay. That may have occurred, um, I can't say for sure, but are you aware of the Chevron uh, debacle uh, up in Blind River, Canada? No. Tell oh. me about it. They built a, uh, they had oh, they, a big wad of timber up there, bought a whole lot of, I mean, sec hundreds of sections up at Blind River, I think it's in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they had it all cruised and everything like that. They spent something like, uh, I guess, a couple of million dollars, which was big time money in that time. And uh, they operated the mill, I think, for about two or three months. You may have a record of it, but uh, they operated the mill for a very short time, and the timber was just nothing. In what way? How is it nothing? It was just small. It was suitable for pulp. Huh. Uh, that almost broke Chevron Hickson. Is that right? Yes. They they were so close to bankruptcy or just going broke in the early, I would say that happened around 32 to 34, somewhere yeah. around in there. I'm yeah. just guessing. Yeah, it could have been. I I have a just this advertisement again from the Timberman, and it shows Blind River, Oregon, or Blind River, Ontario mm -hmm. as one of their, their outfits. Mm -hmm. And this was 1929, so as you say, if it was oh, okay. in the early 30s, then then that could have been when they started suffering. Ron, well, they may have operated longer than, yeah. than uh, but I know that uh, the timber just wasn't there, and it was just losing money like crazy. The uh, little twist to it, uh, if you, they, they, of course, they had all this, hundreds of sections up there, and the twist was that, of course, about. Uh, 25 years later, it became a tremendous uh, uranium oxide source. Mm. It was just incredible uh, at that, in, in about the mid 40s. If you could only see into the future. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but you think that, that uh, it's possible that, that uh, Shevlin, Carpenter, and Clark may have had connections with Brooks Scanlon in that area? Or Possibly because yeah. of the limited part of it. Yeah. And they also may have had a joint marketing. Uh, they had separate marketing companies. I recall Dad talking about that because he was sales manager when he returned the band. Mm -hmm. And um, so they may have had in a certain part of mid Canada or eastern Canada, they may have had separate marketing companies. And, and maybe at certain times the Brooks and Chevron joined to reduce overhead. It was during the Depression. Yeah. And I would say that was probably a depression. They were desperate yeah. at yeah. that time. Okay, you just you've mentioned your dad a couple of times here, John, but uh what kind of work did your father, Crosby Chevron, uh do with the company? He started out uh didn't have a silver spoon uh, at the company. He started out working the green chain for six months or a year, and then he gradually worked at different positions in the sawmill. And I think then he got into sales in band, and then eventually he was uh, transferred to Omaha for two or three years in a sales office, which is probably on one of your offices shown there. And then, um, Back to uh, back to Ben, maybe briefly. Yes, I think he was in Omaha, maybe for two or three years, doing sales. Uh, sales. It, there's a sales office mm -hmm. there, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, back to Ben, and that's the time my sister Cynthia and I were adopted. Mm -hmm. And then I would say that we left about 1931 and 32 for Minneapolis, and we were there until about 1942. At that time, we moved back to Hattie Shevlin had died just about then, and we moved back to um, back to Bend. And while your dad was uh, in Minneapolis, he did he was in sales. He, I don't know what uh, I I think as your maybe your literature indicates, he was the representative for the Ben Song. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, Those were the corporate offices there. And I would guess that most of the, his associates and whatnot were, had certain segments of operation. Maybe someone had McLeod or something like that. You mentioned that he uh, had cut his teeth, so to speak, 
in working, doing mill work, green chain pony. Was right. it, where was that? In Bend. They did that in Bend. Yeah. So uh, right after he got out of the army, which was about uh, oh mid eighteen, something like that, or, or I would say early nineteen, mm -hmm. as soon as he got out of the army, and and doing that kind of work prepared him then as far as or gave him uh, kind of a background to... Oh yes, well uh, I think that was if he was going to be in that business he might as well know what number two common is and the uh, C clear and things like that, four quarter and eight quarter and the different grades and something about a dry kiln. Was, was that something typical that the management for Chevron Hicks and Company did or or the Chevron Carpenter and Clark companies to put these guys down on the floor and I really them. don't know. Yeah. Okay. I don't know whether uh, I don't think Pennell Hickson ever worked there, but uh, I know Dad did. Yeah. And uh, I'm a little bit murky. I could probably research a little bit of it for you on that. Uh, okay. Turning our attention uh, to the Chevron Hickson Company in Ben. Uh, to the best of your ability, uh, and I, I realize that this was before your time, but you know maybe you've heard things you know through the years from your dad or, mm -hmm. or relatives. Uh, but how would you describe the company's success between the years when it first began production in 1916 until about 1928? I think it was quite successful. I, I think uh, it was. Uh, well, there was an abundance of timber. The, I guess it took a few years to really get going, but uh, I think it was quite successful then. Uh, profitable. Were there any external signs that would that lead you to this conclusion as far as uh, uh, expansion or? Well, no, not really, but except that if they could drop two million in uh, Blind River and not go broke, they must have had some money in the bank. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's about the only thing I can really judge it by. Yeah. They dropped a wad up there. Yeah. At, at Blind River? Yeah. And, and Blind River. Yeah. 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 It appears as though they did at, at, at Bend also, uh, you know, in Seattle and Hicks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a, an advertisement here from an issue of Timberman. Uh, dated April 1918, and in this advertisement, the lumber industry of Klamath County hopes to fill some 2,300 positions in timber-related jobs in Klamath County. Uh, considering the size and scope of the Shevlin Hickson operations when they first began, why do you suppose uh, they didn't advertise in a like manner? It, uh, it may be that, uh, well, this is an association ad of about uh, well, 12 or 14 uh, smaller companies, I would guess, in their aggregate, mm -hmm. and they're just advertising that they, they have uh, these opportunities available here and there. Mm -hmm. Most of the names I don't even, I wouldn't even know. In fact, I don't recognize one name here. Yeah. When, when, the Chevron Hicks and the interests came out to Ben to begin their mill. Uh, did they have a a crew basically that followed them out from Minnesota? Uh, a crew of people, management, and people who would work in the woods, uh, experienced people that that the Chevron Carpenter and Clark Company uh, relied on and. That, hey, we have this mill we're opening up in Bend. Or would you be interested in moving out there? It would be my guess. I think they still had some operations in Michigan or somewhere around in that area. And uh, Tom Shevlin would draw on all the help he could. He was just a very dynamic man. Uh, how did the Great Depression of the 1930s affect uh, Shell and Hickson Company? Heard them quite a bit. Operations and timber cutting. Uh, oh, yeah. they're just. I mean, they. I don't imagine they were cutting like they were in the, the 40s. I doubt that they were cutting 100 million feet a year. Uh, I would guess it'd probably be half that, and they probably weren't cutting on more than one shift. Uh, 
you know, out running the mill on more than one shift. I just don't know. I don't know the history there. Okay. Uh, but they were obviously doing well. And they, like so many other companies, they were hit hard by the yeah. depression. And Flying River just about did it. Yeah. Okay. It was touch and go. Was it that you're aware of any kind of reorganization of the company or uh, reduction in the workforce? No, I'm not aware of that. I just wasn't, never got into that. Okay. okay. You know, my reason for asking, uh, well, let me, before I go on with that, let me, let me ask you if you have any idea how long uh, the difficult conditions of the, the Depression lasted. Well, the severest part, of course, was around 1933, and, and it, until the war started, it, uh, you know, the economy was just slowly getting out of the mud. So kind of off and on. Yes, and then all of a sudden, boom, the war came along, and then they were operating, I think, six days a week and two shifts. Uh, and now what I was getting at is that the reason that I, I ask is because you know, most of the people that I have interviewed have been folks who have lived in the camps, uh, have fairly long memories of you know, growing up there, or working there, or living there at one time or another of their lives. Uh, and what they remember during that time, during the Depression, is that most of the folks uh, chose to remain in the camp. Uh, and that what they seem to remember is that the company didn't charge them for company housing and that once a week the company would bring out groceries and supplies to the camp and that they weren't charged for them. Uh, what do you think about that? Hmm. I'm not uh, aware of that, but I'm not surprised because I think they always took an optimistic approach and that, you know, things were going to turn around. And um, I'm not sure that the company had that, well, they probably had that capability even when they were almost broke. Yeah. yeah. And, and I hear the, you know, the folks telling me this too, but my thoughts always return to, you know, well, this was the Great Depression. It was a, a national economic crisis. Uh, not only individuals, but large, powerful companies were very adversely affected. And given those considerations, I always find myself wondering inside my mind, does providing free rent housing and food and whatnot make good business sense? Uh, during hard economic times. Oh, I think so, because the housing was already paid for, and and they did have workers if they needed them. Uh, I'm certainly better for the people than now uh, riding the rail. Mm -hmm. I mean, once they were gone, they were going to be gone, and uh, you had all that talent there. And if you could get over some of the bumps, well, you're better off. Yeah. Uh, so you had. So in a way, then you had. Uh, when you did operate, at least you had a, a ready and reliable workforce. Right, and maybe they traded off, so paychecks were, you know, traded off here and there, and they could work every other day or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they worked by scale or what. You know, whether the choppers worked by scale, I have no idea. Yeah, I, I think it was mostly uh, by the thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, how did the years during the Second World War affect uh, production? Well, uh, if in the pilot viewed in, there used to be, by the front lobby desk, there used to be two large pine panels. I don't know what's happened to them when the pilot viewed in was all the stuff was auctioned off. But they had um, one for Brooks Scandal, one for Chevron Hickson, and annual cut, you know, whether it was 100 million or 110 or whatever it was, and it had employees and, and some other data about the two sawmills. They were beautiful panels. Well, I would say that that was, those panels were probably made of late 30s, 
or early 40s, something like that, before the war, because I know their production went through the roof because they were operating two shifts. I know Dad was uh, had to be on roller skates, practically, uh, to uh, keep up with all the demands of the government. And the box factory, which was always a money loser, was uh, going like crazy. And uh, I remember I asked Dad one time, I said, well, if they're so hard-pressed for lumber, why don't they run three shifts? Well, of course, at that age, I didn't know. Well, you've got to grease things, you've got to sharpen things, and stuff like that. But they, I think they were working six days. Mm -hmm. uh, what about maintaining a, maintaining a workforce? You know, I mean, again, you're kind of going from <coughs> one national crisis to another national crisis. One was an economic crisis, the other was kind of national security. Uh, but with that, uh, there were all kinds of other uh, war-related industries, and apparently uh, people from all walks of life kind of picked up and, and moved to these lucrative war industries. Did, did Shevlin Hickson, as far as you can remember, did they have problems maintaining a workforce or, or keeping a workforce there? I don't believe so. Um, uh, it, just one of my experiences when the war uh, broke out, Dad went over to Fort Snelling in St. Paul and volunteered, but they, they wouldn't take him, uh, number one, because he had to always shoot left-handed because his right eye was bad, and number two, uh, because he was considered in a vital industry, and they need, needed, not that sales as such was such an important thing, but distribution was important, which is, I guess, a part of sales, and he was in a vital industry. And they wouldn't accept it mm -hmm. uh, into the. He wanted to get back in the army. Yeah. And uh, subsequently, uh, he transferred out to Bend. And uh, but I never knew of any. I know that a lot of the young men went to war, but then a lot of people were uh, in their say their forties or fifties, and everyone. The population never changed in Bend, as far as I know. When we got there in '42, I think it was something like. He used to make a joke out of it. I think it was 10,021, and when we got there, that made it 10,025. <laughs> the, the need for everything was crated then. I mean, anything that went overseas, shells were crated, everything was crated. Well, you had to have lumber, mm -hmm. right? They used to uh, load the uh, boxcars and then take them down to Portland or over to uh, the Dallas, maybe, or whatever. They took them on passenger trains. They, they had to have it that fast. They, they didn't want a 10-day freight train. They wanted it in a three-day passenger train. So you would have boxcars going on passenger trains. That's how desperate the need was. Yeah. yeah. And that was, that was my understanding as well, uh, that it, you know, it was an essential war industry. Yes. Uh, but, and in fact, it was it was so essential at one time, evidently, that uh, they, the government tried to put a freeze on uh, timber workers' movements uh, to keep them in the industry. I'll be darned. Uh, which, of course, which, of course, didn't work. <laughs> Would they all want to go to shipbuilding? Or well, yeah, apparently a lot of them went to shipbuilding. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, I, I was just curious whether or not uh, you or your dad had noticed whether, you know, boy, you know, we, we need to bring more people in here, or you know, we're losing people, or, or whether there were any changes kind of in the profile of, of the company at that time. I don't remember specifically a lot of people I, uh, moving away or going anywhere, but. Uh, that would only be because of my observations and the limited number of friends that I had there. Because I went to Bend High in the seventh grade in a parochial school there in the sixth grade. And then they sent me away to private school in the eighth. So I uh, went to Bend High in the eighth. Uh, so, but I never noticed any friends going away. And this would have been 1943 or something like that, you know, with their parents moving away. But keeping in mind that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my name was Shetland, and um, 
people had a funny feeling about associating with you and if someone moved away that was say someone pulling on the green chain and his dad doing that or something like that I wouldn't necessarily know the reason behind it I just know that one of my friends has gone okay uh, as rival companies operating in the same timber district uh, what was Shevlin Hickson's and Brooks Gamlin's attitude towards one another very friendly okay. as far as I know uh, it seems to be that way to me also. It's interesting in, in speaking with uh, some of the other informants, and maybe it was just a matter of company pride, but it was kind of, oh, there was always this animosity between Shevlin and Hicks and Brooks Scanlon, and I think it might have been more camp competition. That may have been, and, and also they were competing for, for the same markets, of course. Uh, I think it was a friendly rivalry. I thought it was friendly enough where they never had their whistles go off at the same time. Uh, one was definitely independent of the other, but there was usually a five second or ten second difference in the start or quitting time. Okay. Well, Shevlin Hickson arrived in Bend in 1915 uh, and began construction of their mill on a grand scale. Uh, at the time of its completion, it was con considered one of the largest and most modern pine mills in the world. Right. Uh, with such capital and facilities at their disposal, did Shevlin Hickson anticipate being a permanent part of the local economic community? I believe so. Uh, if numbers serve me right, there was something between 15 and 20 billion feet, that's in B, billion feet available for Brooks um, and Shevlin Hickson. And it may maybe I'm including Gilchrist in that too, but that whole southern area there and southeast area. Um, so if you project it out, uh, there was going to be a long term pull. I mean, you're looking at you know, 50 or 100 years if they sustained it, but that isn't what happened. Yeah. And uh, which kind of leads to the next question as far as the, did Shevlin Hickson employ a, a cutting policy that would ensure long term economic stability? No, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think many people did in those days. Uh, and I think it was, uh, I mean, they had no reforestation program that, that I'm aware of. I think it was, well, there's so much here, I mean, how could we ever use it all? But in the war, they have, you have to remember, they almost doubled their production. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, it doesn't take too many 200 million feet to equal a billion, and you get three or four years of that, and you make a big hole in that. Yeah. yeah. I think that if our memory serves me right, they started out in 1916 cutting about 80 million board feet a year, uh, but then they they tripled their mill capacity within a 10-year period. Uh, of course, the depression hit. Uh, but yeah, uh, so yeah, that was a pretty good size operation. Yeah. It seems to me that on the, uh, I have to probably correct my thoughts on what was hanging in the fine tavern, but maybe those, I remember both Brooks and Shevlin had it was shown as about 600, 650 employees, as I said, six to seven hundred around in there. And I think the numbers were something like 90 or 100 million feet. But maybe that was uh, a depression number. I don't know. Do you think that if they had employed a different cutting policy, things might have been different? Uh, possibly. But the period of from uh, 16 or uh, F when they got started to 50 is only 35 years and you don't grow old growth in 35 years. Mm -hmm. But not even through like selective logging or, or sustained yield uh, cutting policies might have... No, I don't, I don't believe it would have occurred to uh, unless they could uh, do a lot of uh, national forest, get a lot of national forest because that's a tremendous rate, 100 million feet a year, a tremendous rate. Yeah. yeah, the only only thing I guess they could have done would have been to have cut less. That's the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Sustained might have been 35 million or something, yeah. which might have been more inducive to 
a long-term permanent yeah. uh, permanent commitment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, and and this next this next question is kind of touchy for me, but I've I've seen uh, a couple of references in documents that I have uh, concerning Shevlin Hickson uh, and Brooks Gannon also, uh, but. Those documents refer to the company as those that cut out and get out. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that Shevlin Hickson employed those kind of cut cutting policies? Well, Ron, I can't say for certain. Uh, on the surface, it appears that uh, they didn't have any super long-term interest and then might move on to somewhere else, or maybe they felt they could buy I think if Tom Shell had been around, things would have been a little different. I'm just guessing. I think there were more financial people involved than lumber and timber people involved in the, some of the decisions. And uh, I think it just would have been different. Yeah. Uh, you know, because there is this comparison that I have recently been looking at between, say, Shell and Hicks and uh, in Bend, Oregon, and the Warhauser outfit in, of course, in Klamath Falls, uh, and one did adopt uh, sustained yield policies back in the 30s. Warhauser, yeah. Yeah, Warhauser, did. yeah. And of course, as I said, up until last week, they were still operating, uh, and Chevron Six Hickson had sold out, not adopting those, those same policies. Uh, over 30 years ago now. Well, I think uh, Dad knew, went to, in fact, went to school with uh, Phil Warehouser and uh, uh, knew him quite well. And I think Warehouser started that, oh, uh, in Washington, long, you know, up in the Longview area long before uh, the Klamath operation. In fact, I don't even think they had anything going down in Klamath for. Till twenty, till twenty nine. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. 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 But that kind of implies a, a commitment, don't you think, to the community that you're opening up these stands of timber in? Uh, that we we have this amount of timber, and if we want them to last uh, for generations, so to speak, then we need to manage them this way and cut them this way. I think that was probably could have been readily projected. Uh, from the, the day they planned those two sawmills there, both Brooks and Chevron, they knew that long term it was going to be cut out. And I don't think there was, it was just a matter of making money. Chevron mm -hmm. uh, Hickson, I, I want to interject something here. Uh, during the war years, uh, they were paying a 40% dividend on their stock. Are you aware of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When Hattie Shevlin died, uh, Ned, I think, got about 80% of her estate, and uh, Dad got 20%, but, which was equivalent to, let's say, $100,000 or something like that. But the dividends were 40000 a year. So a lot of people became very wealthy, but additionally wealthy, having survived the Depression, uh, became additionally wealthy during the war years because of those hefty dividends, but that was also countered by the fact that the highest tax bracket, I believe, was 94%. So that was a big chunk yeah. during the war. Okay, let's see. I understand that uh, Shevlin, Carpenter, and Clark uh, own considerable timber, timber holdings in Mexico. I'm not aware of that. Okay. Uh, that could well be. They had stuff all over the place. Yeah, okay. So, so then whether they had it in Mexico uh, is a, a, a good probability. Do you know of other places around the world that they might have had timber holdings, or if they did? I would say probably it was uh, in, uh, it would be either Canada or Mexico, but not anywhere else. Okay. I think it was just too far flung for them to manage as it was. Okay. This one is an interesting for me, an interesting one for me. There's a popular story. Uh, that circulates around Ben that the acquisition of Shevlin Hickson by Brooks Gammon was determined by the flip of a coin and that Shevlin Hickson might just as easily have acquired Brooks Gammon 
had the coin landed a different way? When and why did Shevlin and Hickson decide to sell their holdings to Brooks Scanlon? I don't know. Okay. Uh, I think that's an interesting story, and I've heard something like that alluded to. But and one of the interesting things was that I think Shevlin had just pumped oh anywhere a million and a half dollars into rebuilding the mill. So I don't know the exact amount. Maybe one, may have been two, but they just completely rebuilt the thing. And then for why? And a lot of people wondered why didn't Brooks just move right in? And that's uh, something all the people that could answer that are gone. There's no record of no insiders are going to talk to you about that. So you don't know as far as. Uh, whether this was a relatively quick decision or one that had been in the works for several years prior to uh, the acquisition? My conjecture would be that it had been in the works for several years, uh, probably starting right after the war when demand kind of fell off. And, uh, well, we, you know, that there was a little, uh, things lagged right after the war in the late 40s, you're probably aware of that. And uh, so that was kind of a little shock. I think it was in because it doesn't take much of a guy uh, in the, the eighth grade to figure out where you've got so many sections left, you're cutting so much, um, and you own so much, you know, where's it all going to end? You're going to run out in five years. Yeah. I mean, and I think the war probably cut that time by another five. Yeah. I'm sure it did too. Of course, again, you could always back up and say, okay, if we're going to remain operating, then we're going to have to, to cut our, our workforce down to a, to a quarter, uh, and that way we can continue operating. But right. apparently, uh, they chose not to make that decision. Well, I think they had a lot of, uh, I think money was the object, and the greed was there. I really do. And I think that was primarily uh, uh, done by the Minneapolis people, the carpenters. Okay, so the Minneapolis people then, can you give me uh, names or positions of who those those folks who kind of uh, ran the corporate headquarters? Well, I, I don't know who Nina Carpenter's dad's name was, but my sister went to school with her, Northrop School, and uh, uh, but he w he was one of the wheels, or son of you know one of the wheels, and they had quite an interest. I don't know if there were any Clarks around by then. And uh, the Shevlins, I don't know what my uncle Ned, what his position was there. Well, I don't think any of them were VPs or anything like that. You'd have to look at a Shevlin Gardner Clark makeup to see that. I think it was a financial decision, and, and they just said, uh, it doesn't make any difference. And then look at Brooks, you'd go out, and I don't know what the mill sold for, uh, or the land, or anything like that. I have no idea the conditions of the sale, but they probably said, well, heck, Brooks has only got 10 years, or 15, or whatever. It wasn't worth it. Uh, so that was what it boiled down to. Uh, for the people, uh, who were living and operating and working back in corporate headquarters, uh, it wasn't worth it to continue having this mill operating 1,500 miles away. Take the money and run. It wasn't a money maker. Yeah. Okay. It was making money, but it was a matter of, well, we got this deal, we can sell our holdings and get out of it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I wish I was wrong, but I think that's really what it came down to. When the company closed, uh, and again, this, this you may or may not know, but when the company closed, were uh, any provisions made for the employees who had worked for the Shevlin Hickson Company? I have no idea. Uh, that was in 1950, and, and uh, that was in between times that I lived in Bend, and I don't know. I think it kind of hurt the shock the community a little bit. Yeah, it was it was definitely a shock to the folks that that uh, the grunts. 
that lived in the camp. Right. Yeah. Uh, my question to them was, when did you first hear about the announcement of the closure? And their answer was, when we picked up the newspaper that day. Uh, and so they didn't know anything about it. And they were shocked and they were surprised. Uh, and I guess one of the reasons that it, it's what took them by surprise, but it's also surprising to me, is because the company seemed very paternalistic. Yes. They seemed to genuinely care for the people who worked for them and to take care of them. Uh, and this seems out of character to suddenly say, you know, that Shevlin Hickson will be selling the Brooks Scandler. And so I wondered if, if you knew of any provisions that might have, you know, whether they could go to work at uh, the McLeod River Lumber Company or anything like that. I don't know, uh, because times were still not that good in 1950. And um, I would say that a lot of people were still out scrambling for work. I think that it was, my guess is it was a financial thing, and they carried it through the Depression and and uh, made awfully good money during the war years. And uh, let's get rid of this headache. We put a million and a half bucks into this thing a year ago, and it just isn't working. Yeah. So let's push a button and blow it up. Okay. My guess. And, and uh, I'm just, you know, still for, you know, for the people who, who lived there and worked there for years and in the camps, uh, they don't, to this day, understand, you know, their, their response is, Shevlin Hickson was the bigger of the two companies between Shevlin Hickson and Brooks Camp. Uh, they were the most efficient, and speaking for them, it would be, I don't know why Shevlin Hickson brought Brooks Scanlon. I'd have thought it would have been the other way. Uh, and so that's a dilemma to this day that they still kind of struggle with with themselves. Well, no one, I, I know, and no one can figure out why didn't Brooks just, you know, uh, bulldoze their sawmill and move across the river. That's right. Is that ego? Well, and that's that's where one of the fellows said there was this certain animosity. He, yeah. This fellow said that Brooks Gamlin didn't want anything to do with something that said Shevlin Hickson on it, even though they had this brand new remodeled mill. And then, see, Brooks Gamlin, they, they uh, rebuilt their mill a couple years later at tremendously more yeah. expense to themselves. Yeah. So. Well, that might have been Tommy Brooks. <laughs> You know that personalities yeah. entered into it, and uh, but I think basically that it was uh, money, and maybe Brooke Scanlon felt well, gee, three or four more years cut or whatever Shevlin had left, that was worth a lot to them to extend the life of their investment, and uh, but how they ate that mill and just rubbled it, I just don't understand. Of course. Parts of it, like the dry kilns, were 30 years old. Yeah. You know. But you don't think it happened by the flip of a coin? No. Okay. Did you ever work for the company? No. What What did you do in, in during your acting work life? Well, when Dad, Dad quit about 1945, just said, I, you know, enough. And I think there was some politics involved. And, and uh, so we moved to uh, Marin County in California. And he opened up a wholesale lumber business. And uh, then eventually he opened up a retail yard. And that's when I went to work, got familiar with the lumber business. Then I left there. Dad kind of retired, and I left there. And I, I went up to uh, Oregon, and I... Uh, Worked in the same uh, one of the buildings, Shevlin Hickson, that was it wasn't Oregon Wood Products; it was Shoemate Products. And coincidentally, or ironically, Ralph Shoemate and his wife Bernice owned the house that my father had built in 1928, whatever it was, mm -hmm. on 37 Glen Road. Yeah. So that was my story. And then I went back to California. And and uh, built a dry kiln in Santa Fe, and uh, then uh, bought 
lumber and whatnot. I had a sawmill interest up in Willits, and then uh, the rains in 1855 washed all the logs down the river and out in the Pacific Ocean, uh, where I financed this guy's log deck. So I'd have a winter supply. And so that put me out of business. So that's my history of that. Mm -hmm. Well, what has become of the Shevlin Carpenter and Clark Company? Do they still exist? There's nothing extant with Shevlin uh, name as far as I know. Okay, so, so when you know we, we saw this list of companies, and at the head of it was the Shevlin Carpenter and Clark Company. Yes. When in 1950, when Shevlin Hickson basically sold out or liquidated. Uh, Everything was liquidated to, to so the best of my knowledge. Shevlin, Carpenter, and Clark. Everything's gone. Yeah, it's gone. Okay. Disbanded, liquidated, whatever. Okay. And that was then kind of divvied up or divided up between the stockholders and yeah. everybody went their separate ways. Right. To the best of my knowledge, that's exactly what happened. Not a good year, 1950, for Shevlin, Carpenter, and Clark. Well, it was. If you had, uh, well, it wasn't so bad, uh, except that you could see the handwriting on the wall. And I think they, it was good as far as some of the people that had considerable amount of stock. And it was time to pull out and move on. Right. Stolen right. here and warmed up. And we'll go back through this, and I'll ask you whether there any remembrances oh, that you would you would like to add to what we've talked about today. Well, I I went out to several of the camps. I used to ride with uh, Jack Meister and Bub Schuler. That's A L O Schuler. It was his initials. But, and I don't remember Bub's uh, position, but of course Jack was the woods boss. And I used to ride out there, oh, during the summer I'd go maybe two or three times as long as they could stand me. And uh, But it was always interested, interesting. And then we would go to the uh, cookhouse and have lunch. And, and uh, they were always talking business. I'd just sit there and listen. And I liked watching them, you know, do the flat car loading and whatnot like that. So what, what time was this? Nice. This would be about in the um, oh, 43. So they were in full production. Oh, booming, yeah, booming. And uh, but I, I do want to say one thing: is you may find some interesting comments if you can locate Hardy Myers' kids, because he was there during all the action, and he sure must have known them. He had two children, I think, a little girl, and a little boy. And they may not be in Prineville, but I bet some of those were there. Yeah. Yeah. They were they were uh, somewhat younger than I. They were probably five years younger. Um, definitely, I've, I've got a Ben telephone book, and I'm continually, you know, coming across a name, and I'll look in that book first thing, and you know, then I'll start dialing numbers. And of course, nine nine out of ten, is somebody new, and, you know, not yeah. related. But yeah, I don't know who he worked for. I can't remember the name of the company now, but he got a job just boom like that, went over to Prineville. Yeah. And it was a pretty good size operation, I guess, but nothing on the other scale, you know. But you had to eat. And I was I suppose he was lucky to get a job. But I remember uh, just a little about the camps and I don't remember the I remember going up the steps on to the one of the cookhouses or whatever to get a hamburger or whatever we had flapjack, and uh, it was not like it was set. The building was on skids. I remember that it was like it was on track because it was two or three steps. It was like getting on a Pullman. Yeah. 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 Most of the most of the folks I talked to, of course, the company buildings apparently all stayed on the rails. You know, the post office. Cookhouse, the dining room house, the, the bachelor's quarters. Uh, most of the folks say, "Yeah, it was about a, you know, a six foot height up off of the rails." Because you know, of course, you had the wheels, and then you had yeah. the, the train trucks themselves that the cars sat on. Uh, so 
so your your remembrance about yeah it's up off the ground is, is certainly right. Uh, you may not be interested in in uh, this, but my grandmother uh, had a book published, or my uncle and father had it published after she died, and it's a book called The Clark Industry that got Clark Ancestry. I have it, you, before you leave, you might want to take a look. Sir. There was only an edition of 200. I know it doesn't relate to the camps. Probably not, yeah. But you've asked me a couple of questions that might be discussed in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else you could think of? I can't right now, but okay. I might. If I do, I'll write it. All right. Well, I would be 